Okay, so now I speak in English because in the future, when I'm invited again, I will speak in French, but not today. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to be here to talk to you about probably my favorite theme that is copyright. I've been studying copyright for the last 15 years, perhaps, and my, uh, after speaking French for some minutes, it's difficult to change. <laughs> so, ma, 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 la maîtrise et le doctorat étaient le deux uh, droit d'auteur. Uh, so, I've been working with that for uh, some years, and I'm still very interested in, in copyright. But for this very short presentation, around 40 minutes, I would like to talk to you uh, about some thoughts. I, but not only me, of course, but that we've been discussing in Brazil, and that's why I will bring some Brazilian examples for you, especially more at the end. So uh, I'd like to, to start with an example. It's not a Brazilian example. It's a, a, an American example. This is Richard Prince. He's an American artist. And uh, in the last few years, he was involved in some controversial works of art because his last works were related to Instagram. He went to Instagram accounts, you know Instagram, the, the app for pictures, and he copied some pictures of other people and he made uh, comments. Sometimes you can see that the last line is a comment of Richard Prince. Sometimes the comments are only drawing, sometimes are uh, sentences. But he, after making the comment, he printed the picture and he made an exhibit with the pictures. But not only that, he sold the pictures. And he sold the pictures that were in the exhibit for $100,000 each. What admires me most is not Richard Prince willing to sell the pictures, but somebody who wanted to buy the picture <laughs> for $100,000. But of course, after that, until last year, I was trying to understand what was going on and what was the consequences of his work. And until the end of last year, 2015, he had been sued by one man, if I'm not mistaken, because of the use of the picture. But now for this presentation, I, I made a new research and I found more recent uh, news. This is from August this year. Instagram model and makeup artist sues Richard Prince over copyright infringement. And this one, which is even newer, uh, Richard Prince sued again over new portraits portraits Instagram themed show. Of course, because he simply took somebody else's picture and it's not only a matter of copyright, it's also a matter, a matter of image, droit d'image de, de la personne. Uh, and of course, some problems would uh, arise from, from this. What is interesting about uh, this situation is that 30 years ago, it would have been impossible for anybody to do such a thing because you would have to go, if you wanted to copy other, picture, other people's picture, you would have to go to their houses and make copies of the picture or go to a public exhibit with your own camera and make a picture of the picture and it would be difficult. But now it is so easy. And that's why he does. In a certain way, we are all the time doing the same thing, except that we are not only, we are not selling the pictures, but we are sharing pictures on Facebook and we are changing pictures and creating what we call memes on the internet. In a certain extent, it's a way of appropriation of other people's work to transform into our own works. Richard Prince, I remember, defended himself saying, when I interfere in the work, making my own comments, 
I am changing the work, so I am the owner of this new work. Which, in my opinion, is not a very good <laughs> justification for what he does. But this is how he justifies what he is doing. Of course, it can also be seen as an artistic intervention that is challenging the status quo and the law, etc. So we have many interpretations for this. But I want to attach to only one. That is, it's easy because anybody here could do the same thing because technology allows us to do such things. And this is the, the main aspect of my presentation today. It's a presentation related to technology that leads us to le, le, le changement qui fait partie du nom de la présentation. But to talk about this changing uh, related to technology, let's go back to 1980s and the 1990s. Everybody watched this movie. This movie is a classic movie. Everybody knows this is E.T. When E.T. was... Uh, when it opened in the United States cinemas, it was June 1982. In Brazil, it opened not much later. It opened six months later, December the same year. Uh, this is a way to celebrate two very important dates, Christmas in Brazil, and my birthday in the United States. That's why it's June the, the 11th. Really? You see? We are so important, right? They... Uh, I was born the same year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Somehow it's a way to celebrate you too. But the movie was launched in VHS, in home video, in the United States only six years later. Why? why? Why so many years? Because in the 80s and still in the 90s, the, the cultural industry had full control over copies. And this is what the, the cultural industry was all about during the, the whole 20th century, controlling copies. And they knew that if they wanted to keep the movie into the drawer without anybody touching the movie for six or 10 or 20 years, they could do that. But now it's completely different, as we know. If you were a fan of Game of Thrones, I'm not, but I know how famous this, this series is. If you were a fan, you don't want to wait until the next week uh, to have the, the new episode in your own country with subtitles in your own language. Because if the, the, the new episode is on TV in the United States, because of globalization and social networks, etc., five minutes later, you will know everything that happened in the episode because of spoilers. And uh, even if, if it's not the case, in a matter of minutes or hours, you will have access to the fully, full episode because of piracy or whatever you want to call. So now we cannot wait uh, as much as we want to have the new release of the book or the movie or the, the music because we know that we don't control copies anymore. Uh, this is due to the theory of market failure. I think everybody has heard of that. When we, we talk about physical goods like chairs, we, we, we can expect the market to regulate it. For example, if we have here, I don't know, 25 or 30 chairs, we can have 25 or 30 people sitting here to watch the presentation. But if we have 40 people, some will not be able to sit down or we will need more chairs. However, when we talk about intellectual property in general, 
it's not only copyrights, but it's also trademarks and patents, the market is unable to provide full solutions for the, 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 the buying or, the, or acquiring access to goods. For example, if I write a book and my book is published, one person can buy the book, can, make, can scan the book, and send the book by email to 30 people. So in theory, this is not completely correct, but in theory, 30 people did not buy the book to get a free copy. So less 30 copies of the book were sold. This is not completely true because not all the 30 people would buy the book because some would say, uh, for free I want the book, but I, I don't want to, I, I wouldn't spend five dollars in this book because I, I don't think it's worth it. But for free, okay, for free I want. So this is not accurate to say that if 30 people got the book, 30 people didn't buy it, but some people didn't buy because of this. And this is why there is a market failure when we talk about intellectual property goods, because I cannot expect the market alone itself to regulate all these transactions. When we get to the year 2000, uh, this is much more evident. This is a picture of, I don't know if you have seen this picture, have you seen this picture before? No? This is a picture of people in the city of Vatican waiting for a new pope because uh, Johann Paulus II had died and people were waiting for the Vatican to announce, to say what the next pope was. And this is 2005, people waiting there. But as you know, eight years later, the new pa pope uh, renounced uh, uh, the, the, the pope I don't know, the pope -ship. I don't know the name. Papacy. The papacy. Okay. And, uh, and now we had to wait for another pope to be announced. And this is the situation eight years later. It's completely different. <laughs> and this is completely different because uh, technology became much cheaper than it was. And we, we all left the passive consumption of culture, and we all became active producer of culture. I remember when I was uh, a child or a young teenager, I wanted so much to make movies. And I, I, I had a friend who had a camera, and the camera was that big. And it was his father's camera. And of course, it, his father didn't allow us to use the camera. It was very complicated, and it was complicated to operate. But we made a movie for school, and it was something fantastic for the time. We managed to make a movie for the school. And 25 or 30 years later, any kid can do that. And any kid can write a book or, or compose a song. And this makes the, the, the whole difference in the way we deal with cultural industry. Uh, in the beginning of this century, we started to have collaborative projects. You all know everything that I'll show. It's Wikipedia, everybody knows it. Uh, people started having blogs as Blogger and WordPress, so people could write whatever they wanted. And this is a, an ancient social network in Brazil before Facebook. And Brazil was, was one of the last countries in which Facebook became a success. Now it's a huge success. Everybody has Facebook. But until 2011, Orkut was the most famous social network in Brazil. It was only in 2011 that Facebook became more um, popular. So Facebook, social network, Twitter, uh, YouTube, where you can upload your own videos, Flickr and Instagram, where you can upload your own pictures, Pinterest, which I 
don't know exactly what's the purpose of the website. And Snapchat that only if you are under 20 years old, you know how to operate. For me, it is a mystery. I divide humanity now in can you operate Snapchat? You're probably a teenager. Can't you? Welcome to our adulthood because adults can't use Snapchat. It's, it's not very intuitive. However, despite all these changes, we insist somehow, and I could stay here for hours, saying how, how much effort is done to transform this digital world and technologies into simulations of old technologies. Kindle, for example, has a way to let you lend or borrow Kindle, Kindle books. But the fact of lending or borrowing books is related to the copies, because if I lend somebody a copy of my book, I don't have the copy with me, so I cannot read that book for the time the book is landed. And this is what Kindle does. When you lend somebody a book, the book is blocked on your, or, on your Kindle, and you cannot read it. But of course, uh, of course, whenever such a technology is created, somebody goes there and makes something on the technology so it will not work anymore, and you can contravene the technology and use the, the good any way you want. It was, some years ago, it was very, not very common, but in Brazil we had, for example, some CDs that could not be copied, uh, what we called DRM, the, or TPM. And, uh, of course, money was spent on technology to prevent the CDs to be copied. But you went to a, a store, you bought a CD, it was not cheap in Brazil. In fact, it was very expensive. Then you spent, I would say, 10 or 15 Canadian dollars to buy a CD, and you couldn't copy your own CD in your own computer. You couldn't make a copy because it was impossible. You couldn't make a copy of your own CD into your own iPod. However, a 14-year-old kid would buy the CD, would somehow change the, te the technology inside, and would copy everything, put it online, so anybody could download it for free and uh, copy the song and have the songs wherever they wanted. In my opinion, this was, in fact, an incentive to piracy because it was much easier not to buy and use the songs anywhere you wanted. And this is why I think the industry decided not to have DRMs anymore, at least in Brazil. Consequences of all these things. First of all, a freedom of choice that will have a concrete consequence. When I was a young boy and I arrived from school, I couldn't do much more than watching TV. I turned the TV on and there were, believe it or not, until 1996, perhaps, or seven in Brazil, there were only six or seven TV channels. No pay TV. Yeah. Only six or seven public open channels in Brazil. So when I was a young boy, all I could do was to choose one of those six or seven TV channels to watch. But now, you have to, you, you can have many more options, like watching movies, and I put here Netflix, but of course it's DVD, it is uh, Blu-ray, any technology to watch a movie you want. Uh, Spotify, I mean, listening to songs. You have Amazon to buy cheap books, many books, for free because they're in public domain, so the access to texts is much bigger. You have your mobile. Any kid has a mobile and you can use for all of these or also uh, to play games. Many are free uh, to use social networks and even do it yourself. When I said I wanted so much to make movies when I was 
a young boy. Now any young boy can make as many movies as they want and upload them to YouTube, etc. The, the direct consequence of this is that uh, although the technology has increased, developed, and we have many more options, the day it still has only 24 hours, and money is finite. It's not in infinite. So I have to decide how to spend my time and my money in a much wider uh, possibility than before. And this is one, I don't say that it's the only reason, but it is one of the reasons why uh, people go less to the movies and buy less CD or pay, for le pay less for content because they have much more free, and I, when I'm saying free, I say legal free content on the internet, but I still have 24 hours. Uh, I have a friend who says, scarcity, what's scarce now, is not my possibility to choose. What's scarce now is my time. In fact, if you want me to watch your movie, you should pay me because why should I watch your movie and not other movies? If, if there are so many other movies legally for free on the internet, why yours? So my time is scarce. What is lacking now is my time it's, and not the possibilities of cultural goods. Uh, perhaps the most important consequence is the possibility to give new voices the chance to be heard. For example, this is Amanda Hawking. She was the first person to sell over one million dollars self-publishing in Amazon. She did everything. Uh, the cover, the text, of course, the, the cover, the promotion, the marketing and everything. And, uh, she earned more than $1 million. The funny thing is that after being so famous, she signed an agreement with a traditional publishing house, perhaps because we still have this fetishism with traditional media. The same thing happened with Susan Boyle. You probably remember her. She came from a TV program, but she became very famous due to internet. She was very famous because of her song playing on the internet. After becoming very famous, she recorded a CD in a traditional recording company. So we still, I think, we still think that to be successful is to be on movie theaters, to record a CD, to publish a printed book. If we don't do that, we are not a successful movie director or singer or author. In Brazil, we have some uh, good examples. This is a singer. He plays a very typical kind of song from Rio de Janeiro, where I, I live. But it's a, ki a, a kind of music more related to the peripheries of the city. So he is. I have never heard of him. He has never been on TV. He has never recorded a CD. But it says here that he earns around 200,000 Canadian dollars per year. Not bad, right? Not bad. For an unknown singer, this is not bad. But he has lots of fans that go to his shows and pay for that. This is uh, another Brazilian. He also lives in Rio. His name is René Silva. And he became very famous five years ago because he lived in a poor area of the city. And some years ago, the government of the state had a program to occupy parts of the cities that were controlled by drug dealers. But they, they didn't send the police like, uh, you go there and you occupy. It was previously informed, so uh, drug dealers could leave the places and th there wouldn't be a, a confrontation. So this happened in many places some years ago. 
This is, uh, I don't know if you can see it right well now, but these are the drug dealers escaping from this place that was being occupied, and the TV was live showing that, and Hene lived in the community. And he had a Twitter account called The Voice of the Community. This is his Twitter account. And he was informing, everybody knew what was going on, because the main TV channel in Brazil was live showing the occupation of that part of the city by police force and drug dealers escaping. Uh, because René was there telling the story from the inside, he had, it's written here, he had 108 followers before he started saying what was going on, and after that he had 20,000 followers because everybody wanted to hear from him. So much better than any journalist, much better than any journalist could do because it was a person from the community reporting what was going there at that moment. This is another example. This is Yasmin Tainá. I'm very lucky she works with me. She is a, a girl from a peripheric part of the city, and she wanted to make a movie. She crowdfunded the movie. She, she didn't want much. She wanted like 2,000 American Canadian dollars to make the movie. She crowdfunded. She got the money she wanted, and this is the poster of her movie. The name is Cabela. It's probably a joke with two words because cabelo means hair and bella means beautiful, come belle. So she wants, she's a black girl who wants to say, look, black hair, black women are beautiful. And after she finished her work, she could present the work in the most traditional, you, you can see here very well, but it is a, a crowded movie theater. The most traditional movie theater in Rio showed her movie, it's a, a short movie, it's about 20 minutes, showed and uh, it was absolutely crowded. They had to schedule three extra sessions so everybody could watch it. And when she produced her second movie, that's also very beautiful. Remember the, the, the rhythm, I said, this is very typical from, from Rio, the guy who earns a lot of money. It's funk, the, the, the rhythm is funk. And she made a movie about the day in which funk singers went to the municipal theater in Rio de Janeiro, which is the most elitist place on the city. Uh, for you to have an idea, the the outside of municipal theater copies l'Opéra de Paris. C'est presque la même chose. Les deux sont, sont, sont pareils. And it's a very elit elitistic place, but she made a movie about the day in which funk singers and dancers went to the municipal theater. And again, it was a huge success, many extra sessions. Finally, one last example. Tangerine, this is an American movie. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's a movie from last year. It, it was made with a mobile. It was made with an iPhone, an iPhone 5. And it is about uh, transsex girls who live in a small city. I don't remember which this, what the city is. But the, the movie was a huge success and won some awards. So, how could we have all this variety? And you know, as well as I do, we could stay here thinking of examples and it would be never ending of how many mm -hmm. writers and, or play writers and uh, singers and video makers are so successful and they are, they are suc successful only due to technology because technology allows them to be successful. However, because this is so new, we also need new business models because the old traditional way of preventing copy is no longer helpful. It, it doesn't work anymore. 
So we need the, these new business models. And uh, I, will, I will show you some of the things we've been researching for some years. Um, my first example is, is not new. It's something that in Brazil has been happening for many years. Um, it's called the industry of Tecnobrega. This is the map of Brazil. Rio de Janeiro is right here on the corner. This is a state in the very north of the country called Pará. It's the name of the state. It's the second biggest state in Brazil. And for many years, they have developed this industry called industry of Tecnobrega. Tecnobrega means techno cheesy or techno kitsch. It's a mixture of techno music with cheesy lyrics. And it's to dance together. They, they usually copy uh, Beyonce songs and uh, they change the rhythm, but it's very famous. Uh, it even went mainstream in the last years. We started researching why it was not mainstream, but now it became. And they had, they have these huge parties, like uh, these are some pictures of the parties. These are the DJs. And there is no copyright involved. The, absolutely no copyright. What they do is they record the songs in CDs, they distribute, they give the CDs to street vendors, and they say, sell the CDs any way you want. So the CDs are sold. People buy because it's very cheap. People buy. They go home. They listen. They like. They go to shows. And then people get paid. Um, according to our research about 10 years ago, there were around 400 parties, public parties, of Tecnobrega per month in the state of Pará. It's a lot. And many times, you would go to these parties, you pay, and at the end of the party, at the end, you could buy a DVD with the recording of the party in which you were. So it was a, a very fast way of making information circulate. This is very similar to Nigerian movie industry. I don't know if you know, but Nigeria is the country in the world that produces the highest number of movies, more than India and more than the United States. And about 10 years ago, we made research um, on this business model, and it's very similar. Nigeria is a country with 150 million inhabitants. It's a lot. Brazil has a little more than 200 million, so it's, it's really a lot. And they, they sell the movies on street vendors, very cheap, so no piracy because nobody's going to pirate something that is already very cheap. And uh, we received in Brazil one um, movie producer, Nigerian movie producer, who said, movie industry in Nigeria is so successful that after agriculture is the area of economy in which more people work. And after petrol is the area of economy more profitable in Nigeria. And uh, I, I, I didn't know if it, was, if it is, was still like that, but this is information from, from February this year saying that annually they produce about 2,500 films, which is still a lot, more than India. India, in average, produces 900 or 1,000 movies, and the United States about 600 movies, but Niger Nigeria is 2,500 movies. It is a lot. And they, it's not said here, but I think they, I can't remember, the, the amount of money they make is absurd. It's only, it's behind only the United States. Of course, because the United States, even if they produce less, they, they get much more money. But Nigeria, exports films to the whole Africa, and there are some uh, Nigerian movie festivals in England 
And if I'm not mistaken, this year the Toronto International, International Film Festival had some Nigerian movies there. Um, other examples were Radiohead. I don't know if you remember, this is from 10 years ago. They released uh, a CD and said, pay whatever you want. Uh, I know you will download it illicitly, so I don't care. You just pay as much as you want. And as, I fa as far as I can remember, the amount of money they got from this pay what you want strategy was around $10 per CD, which is very good indeed, very good. Iron Maiden did something more radical. They decided to investigate where piracy was bigger. And if piracy was big somewhere, they went there to make shows because they knew that there was an interest in their work on that place. So let's not fight piracy, let's use piracy in our favor. Let's not fight BitTorrent. If our songs are being downloaded illegally somewhere, we go there and we offer our show. In my opinion, Netflix is, seems to be the, the best model found so far. This is the best way so far people found. Because for many years, industry just didn't know what to do. Uh, they tried to emulate the physical conduct into the digital world. It was not ver very e e e efficient. It was not very efficient. Um, then they tried to, OK, so let's do this. Let's sell electronic books almost the same price we charge for printed versions. It also doesn't work. So some other models started to appear, and it seems that Netflix is the, the best one. Because you don't offer copies anymore. You offer a service. So look, you pay. And the success of Netflix is because it is very cheap, very cheap. Uh, I, I remember when I was a, a boy, there were those video rental stores. I would pay by the time, I don't know, perhaps two or three Canadian dollars per movie. By the time, 15 years ago, two Canadian dollars per movie. And now I pay less than 10 Canadian dollars per month to watch how many, no matter how many movies I want, and I, I can even share my, my password with other people who, who don't have to pay. So Netflix seems to be, industry is not, I, I think industry is not sure yet what will be the, the, the business model for the future, but it seems to be something like Netflix. Uh, some news, recent news. Netflix isn't just hurting pay TV, it's also slowly killing online piracy. Of course it hurts pay TV, because nobody wants, this is another world. Cristiano was saying that his son doesn't want to wait in front of the TV for the show to start. No, it's only tomorrow, 7 p.m.? No, I don't, I want now, I want to watch the show now, I don't want to wait. Tomorrow at 7 p.m. I'll be doing something else. Um, so of course Netflix is hurting pay TV. But it seems to be also helping prevent uh, online piracy. Online piracy drops in Australia thanks to Netflix. Internet piracy falls to record lows amid rise of Spotify and Netflix. There is a problem, however. What are we going to do with the movies that are not there? When it's a mainstream movie that nobody cares, it's okay. But when we are talking about classics, how are you going to raise your children and not show them E.T.? It's not possible. But if E.T. is not on Netflix, how can we find E.T.? Uh, when there were those video rental stores, the, the catalog was cumulative. E.T. would always be there. But with new, 
ways of creating those catalogs, some classics will not be available. So curiously or funnily, we will have a tendency to have a piracy or illicit downloads of the classics and not of the mainstream movies because we will not have access to them on the future. And there are other, um, other websites or, or platforms in the same sense Netflix works, like Dishflix for India, uh, Indian movies, and these Netflix of games that somebody wanted to create in Brazil, and of course Spotify, as you all know. Now, just to finish my presentation, if we need, because of new technology that gives new voices the chance to be heard, that need new business models, we also need new laws. I know Canada changed the copyright law very recently. And yesterday I was in Ottawa with Michael Geist, and he said something I didn't know, that it seems that the law determines that every five years you should review the law. This is very good, in my opinion, because you, you will always try to make the law fit the, the facts. When I was a young boy, I read many books by Agatha Christie. I loved her. And there was a sentence in each of the books I never forgot. And the sentence is, if the theory, it was the Hercule Poirot, the detective, who said, if the facts don't fit the theory, you cannot change the facts. You need to change the theory because the, the, the facts are unchangeable. And this is something, as I see Brazilian copyright law, for example, exactly this way. People want to change the facts and not the law. It's the law that has to be changed somehow to be adjusted to our contemporary times. I'll give you just one example. Our law was passed in 1998. It's not a very old law, but it got old. Uh, we have a limit, uh, an exception and limitation system. The law says, item by item, what you can do that doesn't constitute something illicit. It's in our Article 46. According to this article, if I make, if I make a very strict reading of the article, if I want to copy the content of a CD that I bought to my own iPod, this is not allowed, which means private copies are not allowed. If I want to show a movie for educational purposes in a public school, this is not allowed. Not even in a public, a public school, unless, of course, the movie is on public domain. If I want to make a copy of an out-of-print book, I am also not allowed so many trivial, everyday situations that we face every day. I want to make a copy of a, a book that's not available anymore. I have the money. I, I, I want to buy. I have the willing to buy the book. If the book was available, I would buy it. But it's not. Why not make a private copy? It's not allowed. I have a class of students, a public school. I want to debate ethics or I want to debate debate Brazilian culture, so I want to show them a picture. It's not allowed. This is so absurd. This is why we need an, another law. We have gone to uh, a degree of difficulty in understanding what the law wants. That I'll give you only one example. This man was a TV presenter in Brazil. Uh, his name was Abelardo Barbosa, but he was known as Chacrinha. He died 25 years ago or more, but even young generation, even uh, teenagers now, have heard of him because he's very famous. And uh, six or seven years ago, mm. a documentarist decided to make a documentary about him and his TV show. And his TV show was a musical TV show. It's impossible to make a documentary uh, without 
showing songs. And our law says that you can use small portions of a work in a new work. And that's what he did. He used small parts of songs in the movie. He was sued. And the first judge to decide said, you are wrong. You cannot do that because your movie has financial purpose because it was shown on movies, movie theaters. But the law doesn't say anything about that. In fact, there is no problem. It's like a quotation. If I quote a text in my book and I sell the book, it's OK. Everybody in this room has done something before like this, like quoting. And we sell the books, and no problem. So only in the second decision, uh, decision the decision was in his favor. But many people don't agree, so there, there isn't an agreement around if it is listed. I, I, I have no doubt that he can do what he did. But among academic community and judges and everything, it's not clear if he can do this. But this is something we do every time. So not even on the, the, the most trivial conduct, we can reach an agreement. Of course, we need to change the law, but one way of adapting ourselves is to create new models of using the law. For example, Creative Commons. This is a website in Brazil, in Rio, from an institute, and they, they work not only not like YouTube, because they are a platform for videos, but only Creative Commons videos can be included there. So everybody knows that these movies can be downloaded for free, can be reproduced, can be distributed, uh, and this, it, this does not constitute an illicit. As you all know, and I'm finishing now, it was uh, Lawrence Lessig who created, developed these Creative Commons uh, licenses. And one day, some years ago, I attended one of his conferences and he said something very clever, in my opinion. One of the problems we face with copyright is that it's only one law, it's the same law, for, for three very distinct groups, professionals, amateurs, and professors, academic people. Because the three interests are very different. Profe a professional writer, probably, who writes novels, probably doesn't want Creative Commons and probably doesn't want his book to be copied because he wants to sell copies of his book whatever way to earn money, to, to get profit from it. Amateurs don't care about money. They are there just for the fun. It's what we do on the internet with memes and, and etc. We don't care. And professors, uh, people who live in academia, they don't want money from the books they sell. You know, we'll never be rich selling our books, never. We want, the, we want our theories to be spread. We want people to read our, our works. We don't want to get money from it. And, and we, we receive money from, from other places, from our jobs and lectures and... and uh, many other things we do. So, in my opinion, if we don't take into consideration those three groups, we will never understand fully the copyright. And I know this is becoming more and more difficult with the technology, the changing of the world, but this is our duty, I think, not to copy only the model and to think that the model that survived almost the whole 20th century is the model to be used nowadays. I think we need new maps and new thoughts and new ideas to cover this new territory. And this is how I, I finish my presentation. And I always finish with the same picture from Rio de Janeiro to remind you that this is the view from our office. And we will welcome you there in case you want to take your own pictures from our office there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.